So thanks for joining us. This is the Wednesday, January 17th meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. The first item of our agenda tonight is minutes. Ooh, there we is. have minutes from Wednesday, January 3rd. So if members have had a chance to review the minutes of January 3rd, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, I move we approve the minutes. Okay. Second. That's moved and seconded. Uh, Jack, we're looking at the minutes of Wednesday, January 3rd. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous with one abstention on Pari's behalf. We'll move on to item two, planning and zoning and the zoning subcommittee report. Um, so, planning board members should listen up, kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we were approached by a, a citizen brigade to to take another look at inclusionary zoning, uh, specifically to make it um, to fix the language so that it applies, in their opinion, so that it would apply to all um, projects that require a special permit for reasons of use or dimensions. Um, and um, the zoning subcommittee was not. Uh, persuaded that that would be feasible necessarily, al although um, at least some of us thought that that something needs to be done to make that language clearer. The language that exists is, is has been a source of dispute for a long time. However, during the course of our discussion, um, it emerged that there was some interest on the part of, of the citizens who came to us to take another look at, at the um, inclusionary zoning proposal that we brought a couple years ago um, that involved um, um, offsets and, and, and other things, uh, it, the, the complicated one from a couple years ago. Um, so, so we are, the, the zoning subcommittee is going to take a look at that next time to see if we think it's fixable or, or, or workable. Um, but whether or not we decide to bring it forward to you, um, it seems likely that, that the citizens will, unless they are persuaded that, that the board is going to um, move, um, the citizens will bring a, a petition to fix inclusionary zoning. So that's um, something to look forward to or not, as the case may be. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, the zoning subcommittee itself um, is is continuing to explore um, how a 40R, a potential 40R um, overlay in part of, of the town center um, might look, um, what, what effect it might have on, on the uh, allowable density in a particular part of the BL zone, the BL zone that is in the middle of, of the downtown. Um, and this is part of our of our ongoing uh, consideration research into into whether we should attempt to pursue a 40R uh, overlay. Um, you know, we want to get a sense of, of what might be possible, what what the outcome might look like uh, before moving. Again, this is not going to be done in time for spring. It's something that that is a long term project um, that we're still advancing on. What might be ready for spring are um, a couple of um, infill type uh, fixes that would allow, potentially allow um, um, additional single family housing or supplemental dwelling unit development in, um, well, they would, uh, as currently proposed, as we're working on them, it would apply throughout town, but it would probably have the most impact in the RG zones. Um, one would be to allow the creation of uh, smaller uh, of, of lots that, that don't have the standard frontage, um, provided that there are um, that there is another lot in the in the nearby vicinity that that shares that dimension. Um, in other words, if there is uh, something like a pattern of of that lot uh, of that uh, frontage um, allowed or, or existing in the neighborhood, then then additional lot. Um, should be able able to be created. Um, so we're we're taking a look at that. That might be ready for the spring. 
if, if um, the board decides to go forward with it. Um, the other one is uh, supplemental dwelling units. Um, f a couple years ago, we, we, the board proposed and town meeting adopted um, um, uh, changes to the supplemental dwelling unit um, language that, that made it easier uh, to do them and, and made uh, the possibilities. Previously, supplemental dwelling units were um, attached or part of the uh, principal use. We made it possible for uh, detached supplemental dwelling units to take place with a special permit. But they were, but they were limited to 800 square feet or 900 square feet with, uh, if they were accessible. Um, feedback that um, staff has gotten and, and, and we have gotten is that that's a little too small for, for some people, um, uh, people who, who want to live in that, in that size, um, need um, more bedroom space maybe than, than 800 square feet allows. Um, so, so we are considering proposing uh, changing that to 1,000 square feet. Um, again, that would, that would make it more likely that someone might actually build a, a supplemental dwelling unit and thereby increase the supply of housing. So, so there's, those are two small infill type um, proposals that, that um, are simple in concept. Uh, we are still preparing the language and, and uh, evaluating them. And um, uh, last, I guess, uh, staff is, is working on um, adjustments to uh, recreational marijuana regulations um, based on, on the draft uh, language that the Cannabis Control Commission has, has uh, put forth. Um, we, we will probably want to uh, react to that, um, including some uh, additional kinds of marijuana use um, uh, uh, establishments, but different kinds of ways of dealing with marijuana. And, um, and some other uh, ways to, to tweak uh, our, our bylaw so that it matches or, or, or it uh, fits in with the state regulations. Uh, again, hopefully we will be able to put something together uh, for the spring. But nothing's ready yet. All right, thanks, Rob. Is there any board comment on zoning? Any public comment, planning and zoning? Any other topics, planning and zoning? Okay, if not, we're gonna move on to item 3A, old business. This is the Amherst Public Art Commission, proposed town of Amherst policy, art installations by private developers on public land. Is there someone here to speak to this? Please come up, introduce yourself. Good evening. <coughs> Thank you for agreeing to put this on your agenda. My name is Eric Brody. I'm a member of the Amherst Public Art Commission, and I wonder if you could use the mic a little bit closer. Thank you. Okay, I wasn't aware it was actually working, but okay. How's that? Is that better? Perfect. Yeah. Um, as you know, we brought this to you early or late last year uh, for consideration. Uh, the idea being, um, now that we have a bylaw that mandates public art in town. Um, construction projects, that it was time to consider uh, and timely to consider um, public art at private development projects. Private, that kind of um, proposal is handled differently in different areas of the country. There are somewhere around 100 municipalities that mandate public art uh, in, in private development projects in town. We are not recommending that here. Um, we have been discussing uh, exactly uh, how this should be handled in a town like Amherst. Uh, we don't want to discourage development, but we do want to encourage uh, public art and building projects here. So we had a productive discussion last night at the Design Review Board. Uh, regarding our proposal and you have before you now I think a slightly revised version of the proposal as a result of that meeting um, the changes that have been incorporated and uh, you have two pages there but the um, the first page that talks about the policy itself 
the changes are not substantive, uh, really, but uh, more in terms of clarity. However, the, in the very first line, um, there was a change that public art can add instead of public art does, because sometimes public art doesn't, we've been told, and I agree. Um, and, but the main change is down in the bottom part, project art on public property number two, which was somewhat rewritten as a result of suggestions made. Uh, again, it's not a particularly substantive, we don't think, <clears throat> but um, mainly clar clarative. The second page brings up an issue that we discussed last night. Um, which wasn't resolved, but it's, it's an issue I think that's worth considering. And I would be interested in having the planning board's view on it. If you look on the page, it's titled Alternative Third Section of, Pol of the Policy, third section being titled Private Development Projects. The first paragraph is the same as, as what exists. What's uh, being suggested here for consideration is the second paragraph, which resulted from a discussion last night as if the town gets into a discussion with a developer about uh, placing public art on, on a property and the developer's interested but wants some kind of a quid pro quo for doing it, and there's some trade off being discussed, some um, per perhaps tax abatement or variance uh, or, or the kinds of things that developers often talk about with, with towns in order to, to get what they need um, to make the, the building work for them, then it seems to me that the town has a stake and uh, more of a stake uh, if they're willing to make concessions in what the um, public art can be. So this is an attempt to insert some sort of um, supervisory role for the Emerson Public Art Commission uh, in determining how that public art uh, is decided. And that was not a part of the original proposal uh, because it, the original pro proposal didn't get into the details of what happens during a negotiation uh, of, about public art with a private developer. So we're thinking of adding that paragraph into the proposed policy in that section. Essentially it says the Public Art Commission would be a consultant regarding the kind of art. And w the way we see that happening is in pretty much the same way it's handled in the bylaw for public art on town property. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the Design Review Board was supportive of this proposal. Um, we're at the stage now that uh, what we're trying to do is refine it to get, make sure that it covers everything it needs to cover um, and determine whether the, the proposal is a policy or uh, just um, recommendations. Uh, guidelines, if you will, or an ordinance. I, th I think we're leaning against it becoming an ordinance. Is it being too cumbersome that way and too restrictive? Um, the Public Art Network of the Americans for the Arts has a lot of information on their website regarding this kind of thing. And they say these, pro these, um, these kinds of proposals, if you will, fall into three kinds of categories, generally guidelines, policies, or ordinances, uh, an increasing level of uh, detail and specificity. Our, ours, I think, falls somewhere between the guidelines and the policy. Uh, if we regard it as a policy, then um, we think, although since we haven't done this before, we're not 100% certain that it would fall under the purview of the select board. Um, if it becomes uh, ordinance, which we're not recommending, then that, of course, would have to go before town meeting. And guidelines, I'm not exactly sure uh, where that would fall. Uh, I think the Art Commission at this point is regarding these more as policies, a policy than anything else. So. 
we bring it to you uh, basically to get guidance on uh, what you think because you deal with this, these kinds of issues with developers, uh, on what's, uh, what you think should be in here that's not in here or what should, that is in here that shouldn't be. Yes, Chris. Um, I just have a comment about this alternative third section of the policy. Sure. When uh, in the second paragraph, um, when you refer to requested variances or tax abatements, um, I think that language may need to be modified. Um, the town rarely gives variances, and they have very strict requirements. So perhaps um, it could be requested modifications or waivers in place of variances. And um, with regard to tax abatements, um, I know that for the tax incentive uh, that we offered for affordable housing, um, we needed to go to the state legislature to get um, a special act passed. So I'm not sure um, what the status of tax abatements is. I know that the town can grant tax abatements for um, people over the age of 65 who are low income but I'm not sure what other categories um, the town is allowed to offer tax abatements for. So perhaps the Public Art Commission would like to look into that and find out um, is this possible without um, an act of the state legislature for the town to offer tax abatements. The, um, the assessor might uh, know more about that, but I, I guess I'm, I have a question about that. I was actually going to raise the exact same question about what mechanism, if any, there was um, to provide those avenues. Um, and I agree with the, the modification that Chris proposed. Another question I have, it sounds like the uh, path of this document is somewhat unclear. As written, it says it expresses the commitment of the select board. So I, I take that to read that perhaps this is a policy the select board might adopt. Um, to the earlier point about any sort of negotiations with um, private developers, it might not entirely or always be the purview of the select board to be having those conversations. So if it is in fact something that you would hope applies to other boards, I hope there'd be some clarity about which uh, boards um, it is exactly that's, that are adopting the policy. Um, I had another question about the section titled Project Art on Private Development Property. Final sentence there says the proposed artwork shall be maintained and conserved as a permanent part of the project itself. The permanent sounds a little bit um, restrictive to me. Um, that's a long time. So I'm wondering if that language is necessary. Uh, it, it's intentional, actually. Uh, most of the public art, uh, it should be considered the same ways as the public, uh, the percent for art projects that. Uh, Significant artwork at development projects are intended generally to be to last as long as the building project itself does, and uh, th this is an effort to ensure that a long-standing piece of artwork is installed and not something that's going to deteriorate in 18 months. Rob, so uh, do you mean do you mean that that? Um, it should say something about um, for the life of the building or the life of the project, not because per permanent implies it extends beyond the building. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think there should be some sort of limiting okay. qualifying factor in that language. All right, I understand you're concerned that the word permanent goes beyond the life of the building. We okay. So, and also, I think in your answer to my prior question, it sounded like the response was indicating, you mentioned public art. That particular passage doesn't mention public art. It mentions project art on private development property. So, is it meant to refer to public art, which is funded through public money? Yes, by public art, we mean art that so it would be owned by the, uh, the private developer. The owner of the property would own it. But by public art, we mean that it's available and open uh, for the public to view that it wouldn't be in the conference room or of a building, but it would be public that way. Any other comments from the board on this? Christine? It's a little wordsmithing, but on number five, the first line is saying um, in the lease that it says the artwork um, shall be maintained 
and conserved is an integral part, so I assume there's like a maintenance schedule. But then on the next line it says if it becomes damaged or needs replacement, then it kicks into this higher level of getting it repaired right. um, or replaced. But in that, that's like to me damage is like it gets whacked and something falls off. But to me sometimes art, especially outside, it just starts to age and fade you know, which is more of a maintenance thing. So if it, if it's not having its maintenance done, like someone has to determine, oh yeah, it's fading, it needs to be repainted or whatever, that's not necessarily damage, but, so maybe on the second line, it becomes damage, needs replacement, or needs maintenance. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, because well, damage just sounds like it got damaged, like. Right, that could happen by accident or, right. or by faulty construction. So, so I'm saying what if as a art piece of artwork ages, which is right. part of the maintenance, but does mm -hmm. the maintenance go into that same, to me the maintenance part should go into the same um, procedure if it's damaged. Uh, so, I'm not sure I understand your so concern. So maintenance to me is like, oh, you know, it gets swept or, you yeah. know, tidied and cleaned. But I'm saying, like, and damage is like it gets whacked or something falls off it or, you know, because I know art comes in different forms. But I'm saying, like, sometimes art just ages as it right. ages over time. So it's, like, fading and it's no longer as attractive as it once was. But it's not damaged and it may not need replacing. So in the second line, can the, it be more broad and also include um, upkeep or that it well, that keeps is the it maintenance. That is included in the, in the, first, the first sentence, that it's the developer's responsibility to maintain it and conserve it as if it is part of the building itself, like the roof or windows leaking. If there's, it needs maintenance, if it needs to be repainted every five years or if, there, if it's a light um, project that involves light, that the bulbs would be replaced if they burn out, that's maintain, maintenance. But if it's damaged, uh, either by accident, uh, uh, you know, if it, I mean, anything could happen to anything that's outside, either by, through the weather or by a car hitting it or vandalism. It's the responsibility of the owner to maintain it as if it were part of the, part of the building. So both are covered. What, what number five does is relieve the town of the responsibility of maintaining the artwork. It, because it's a pri on private property, it becomes the owner's responsibility uh, to, uh, to maintain it. I, I guess my point is I'm trying to, to me, maintenance it, in a non-artistic sense is like you said, the built, like you clean it, you replace a light bulb maybe. But repainting it or whatever could be the artist's like, part of the actual artwork and like a maintenance person would not be painting it or yet it's not, it wasn't actually, it's just the wording becomes damaged where um, that sounds like there was an accident. And I'm saying, I've just seen public art, especially outdoors, that over time it's not damaged or Some art is meant to be. It's just know, aging age. and it just yep. doesn't look as nice. It's yeah. The metal maybe is pitting and it doesn't, it's lost its sheen. So no one's going to maintain that. That's like the artist has to come back and... Or that could be the artist's intent, that it will rust. And, and that's what the could artist be. intends. Could be. Sure. So there would be a lease agreement. Uh, there would be an agreement with the artist, of course, who, between the contractor and the artist. The artist would be hired by the owner. Um, Presumably, with the assistance of the Public Art Commission, if the if it uh, if, if the lease agreement so specifies, um, and there would be an agreement between the artists about a maintenance schedule and what is required uh, for that particular piece of work. Um, um, I know there's a difference between something that that is intentionally that intentionally degrades and then work that is degrades because uh, it's, it was not constructed properly or that it wasn't intended to last beyond uh, 10 years or five years. But uh, what we want to make sure, if it, if it 
If a replacement artwork is necessary because it doesn't last as long as it was intended to, that is the owner's responsibility to replace it. Now, if you think there's better wording for that, I'm totally open to that, but I, I think we've got it covered here. But so if I I'm could, miss, missing something. you know, one of the central mechanisms here is a lease agreement that the artist would potentially, or the developer would be entering into with the town. So that makes some assumption that there's a body authorized to enter into a lease agreement for this public art on public land. So I guess the question there is, would we have to go to town meeting every time we want to lease public land? It seems like I can't think of an authority in place that would permit this. I don't know. Chris, do you have any comments on that? Or Rob? If it's in the public way, wouldn't it be the select board? Select board, yeah. It seems to be the select board. Not in the board public the way, then, then you, have a, you have a point, yeah. Chris? I know for easements and um, transfer of property, we always need to go to town meeting to have it approved. So possibly lease would come under that category? Hmm. Jack? I um, just have wordsmithing. Some of the superlatives there, like uh, the word enormous, strongly encourage. Enormous is the first line background. I mean, just adding value is, it adds value. It's, it's very clear. In private development projects, uh, Town of Amherst uh, could simply recommend, you know, strongly encourage. You're going to encourage it strongly. Doesn't, for me, makes it difficult to. Uh, again, it says wordsmithing. I would strike strongly, at least. Uh, what and then, line is it? Where, where are you? Uh, private development projects, the first line. Oh. Okay. And then significant art, I'm, I'm sure that, that is appropriate, but how would you define significant art? Well, everyone would have a different definition, but the intent here is to, to suggest that it's, that it's um, appropriate for the size of the building that's being constructed. Now, uh, what the Americans for the Arts say in their publications are typically, <coughs> typically um, the art uh, on private developers' projects are the same um, percentage of the budget as in public, uh, in public buildings uh, for the town. For example, if we have a half a percent for art, um, typically, in, in these other places, they're half a percent on a private development project, a half a percent of their budget would be for public art. We did not specify that because we felt that that would be too restrictive, restrictive and um, perhaps too limiting. So we just used the word significant rather than specify a percent, although the board feels that specifying a percent is appropriate, we could certainly do that. Uh, makes me a little bit nervous to do it since, um, ag again, our goal is not to discourage uh, developers from adding public art, but to encourage it. So, um, but that's, you know, I'm in the minority there in terms of what hap happens around the country um, because this is not a large town. Uh, so I'm a little bit reluctant to specify a percent. So if I could, I think that your response transitioned from in terms of size and scale of the artwork to the cost of the artwork. And I think, I'm not sure Jack's question, but I would ask the question of what, what size, and your answer initially about significance was that the artwork would be appropriate in proportion, I think, or scale to the project, which seems like reasonable language to me. Um, I would agree about uh, some clarification on what you mean by significance, specifically if you're talking about size or cost. I don't have a strong feeling personally about size versus cost because I think you can have very significant art that's not sizable. Um, so again, we have to think carefully about how we want to limit uh, what we say here. I'm trying to keep it open without, I want it to be as clear as possible without nailing it down too tightly so that it gives flexibility. Uh, for the in, within discussions and for the artists and the contractors to to determine the best art for the project. Um, I mean, if it's a lighting uh, artistic project of some kind, it would might be difficult to determine that by size uh, as opposed to impact. You know, 
So significant may not be the best word, but it's at least a flexible word. Possibly you may, might want to use something like art, which makes a significant impact to the streetscape or to the uh, area in which it's located or some phrase like that, so that the, the impact becomes the significance rather than the art itself. Okay, I'll, I'll work with that. <laughs> that sounds reasonable. So is it fair to say that this is a work in progress? It's Absolutely. a draft and you'll be back with a later draft? Well, um, let me ask about that. Uh, because uh, who are we ultimately trying to please with this? Are, are you the ultimate determination of how this reads? Or does this then go to another body? Uh, or is it up to the art commission itself? Well, if it becomes a, a a uh, policy of the select board, the select board clearly has to right. approve it. So that seems to me the target. Well, I think that the decision is yours to make about what approach you want to take with this. You mentioned three at the beginning, guideline, a policy, or an ordinance, and I think that that's a good way to sum it up. If you want the planning board to, an adopt, to adopt a policy like this, I would suggest that there's some language that references the planning board, or if you want the planning board to recommend this to the select board, then it should reference solely the select board. But um, just some clarity about what you're looking for you know, could come from the art commission itself. Um, and then I think the planning board would be happy to recommend appropriately. That's helpful. Thank you. Other comments? Chris? Oh, I was just going to say, if it were a zoning um, bylaw, I think it would be in the purview of the planning board. Um, given the fact that this is either a guideline or a policy, probably, um, a policy would be a select board um, issue. I know that when um, we approached them with a complete streets policy a number of years ago, um, it was clearly the select board that dealt with that. Of course, it was streets in that case, but I think if it's a town policy, it really needs to come from the select board. Um, but the Art Commission could certainly request planning board support for its presentation to the select board. Okay. Any other comments? No? So I guess we should expect a, a revision, a, a new draft uh, to... I'd be happy to, to act upon. I'd be happy to supply a new draft with the suggestions made this evening. Great, Rob. I'm not sure we need a new draft. I, I think we, we, you know, we don't need to know the exact language. We know we know what he's trying to accomplish. The the general, the outline of of, of the policy that that he wants the select board to adopt or or whatever. Um, I, I think we can, unless he unless something changes dramatically between now and when he actually decides that it's finished, I think we can say, this seems like a good idea. Um, we, we support your taking it, or we recommend that you take it to, to, to the select board. We rec this, recommend the select board adopt it um, when it's in finished form, or whatever. Or we can ask him to come back if we, if, we, if we want, but I don't think that's necessary. Oh, I agree. I think, I think we, can, uh, we can approve the idea and not worry about the specific language at this yeah, point. Right. I agree as well. Any opposed that recommendation? No. No? Okay. So if you can carry forth with our blessing then. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks Thank for you. joining us tonight. So we're going to move on now to the next item on our agenda. It's uh, old business topics not reasonably anticipated. Are there any of those? No? Okay. We'll move on then to item 4A. This is new business. U Drive LLC, proposed alternative plan for residential development on map 13B, parcel 33. Review and recommendations to Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stutzman, members of the board, Ms. Brestrup. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst. 
here on behalf of U Drive LLC uh, to present to you uh, a conceptual redesign of a project, um, specifically the residential portion of a project down on University Drive here in Amherst. You'll recall we were here October 18th to float the idea by you for the project. Um, you'll also recall hopefully that I think it was 2016 you sponsored a zone change from Office Park to limited business for this parcel of land. The two uses that we are proposing and have proposed, a rest class two restaurant and an apartment building um, could not have been allowed without this zone change. So we have submitted to the Conservation Commission. We've submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and through that process, in an effort to try to accommodate uh, one of the, the Southerly Abutters concerns, we've looked at redesigning um, that Southerly parcel. And so I will show you, let's see if I can get it to be. And so you may recall that we had um, a building here. We had, thank you, Ms. Brestrup, uh, a building here that had those townhouse style units uh, that Kuhn Riddle had designed. And then also a building back here. And, um, what we've done is, and we haven't submitted this to the Zoning Board of Appeals yet, um, we want to get some initial feedback from the Planning Board on site design and architecture before we actually do. Um, but given some of the pushback, quite frankly, that we're getting from the Southerly Abutter for this building, and in order to make the project economically viable, uh, we've had to redesign it in a way to get more density and more units, which you'll see here in this building. Um, we're also considering having some sort of leasing office or commercial space on the first floor of this building. Um, so this may be coming back before you as a mixed use. If it doesn't and it's strictly apartment, we may be coming, we, we would go back to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a different um, Zoning Board of Appeals special permit for the apartment use. So that's a higher level. Um, this proposal has, I think, 50, uh, non-ADA parking spaces, three ADA parking spaces, 52% of them compact spaces. So we're gonna need a waiver from the Zoning Board of Appeals for that, or you from, for that. And um, we're also looking to somewhat self-restrict to one space for one and two bedroom units and to two spaces for three and four bedroom units. Uh, pretty specifically because of the proximity to public transportation and also the bike path. So we thought that this was probably a, a good area to try to reduce the number of parking spaces that, that we would have. You'll see here uh, we've got some bike racks proposed. We've got vegetation and landscaping um, shown on the plan. We, are, we do have a, a wetlands crossing and we do have some proposed wetland replication um, towards the back. Arborvitaes and fencing are proposed along the southerly and southeasterly portion of the property uh, for screening and um, they lead from wetland to wetland so we think that they'll be uh, pretty effective in deterring any individuals from crossing from one parking area to another and, and vice versa. Um, so it wasn't our first design but I think it's one of necessity at this point quite frankly. Um, so I guess if you've got questions of the site plan I'm happy to answer them otherwise I'll turn it over to John to walk you through what the design will look like can you just um, just really general what what are the objections to the to the southeast um, was it noise or light or what sure. um, <laughs> it's kind of been a moving target uh, quite frankly of what those objections are um, they have filed a lawsuit claiming adverse possession and or prescriptive easement over, if you follow my mouse, this portion of the land and also this portion of the land, uh, saying that they have used it openly notoriously against claim of right for a period of 20 years or more. We disagree, um, a little bit boring, but historically this was all owned by Lincoln Pulp and Paper and Lincoln Land and Timber. They had the same uh, president uh, of the board of directors. One was actually uh, collateral for a note for the other. So we don't think, and this went till like 2003, 
It obviously hasn't been 20 years since that time. So we think that substantially on the merits, we have a good argument. The problem is a lawsuit like that can take three years to actually get through. So we went back and thought, well, what can we do? And it was to increase density here and eliminate the need to have anything over here. And quite frankly, try to settle and say, we'll just, if you support the project, we'll convey this land and this land to you and then work together on any potential stormwater issues that you may have um, over in this area. So again, not first choice, but necessity at this point. Um, and again, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer additional questions on the site plan or if you're interested in the architecture, I can kick it over to John. Christine. How many parking spaces were before and now just? So there were 56 parking, I believe it was 56 parking spaces before and then 53 total now, uh, including those 52% of compact spaces. And the handicap that is the same? Yeah, so uh, before there were four, now there are three ADA spaces. And so based upon at least this design's unit count and the number of bedrooms, 50 parking spaces, five zero, would be what's required based on the number of ones and twos, the number of threes and fours, if we restrict to one and two bedrooms, one parking space, and to three and four bedrooms, two parking spaces. So we would have the 50 parking spaces and then have three ADA instead of just saying, let's have 47 with three ADA, just in case it doesn't link up um, perfectly between the two. So it was mentioned you might go the route of apartments or mixed use. So what are we seeing before us? <laughs> um, if it was mixed use, and, and we're working this through the Conservation Commission. So conservation has a 50 foot wetland setback from, for residential uses. They have a 75 foot setback for commercial uses. So we're discussing with Dave Zomek and um, Beth Wilson if there was on the first floor outside of the 75 foot setback, which you'll see if this is 50 and this is 50, your 75 is a thin sliver right here. That's why residential really only works here. Um, but putting some sort of commercial use in you know, this area to meet that mixed use requirement, um, quite frankly, and I think John will maybe talk about it a little bit later, the 24 units in an apartment is really constrictive for design. That's why we've got two buildings here. And it essentially requires that we put all our eggs in a certain basket without the ability to change. Well, sure, we can change. We're still only moving those pieces around of those 24 units. So as you know, with the mixed use, there is no limit to the number of units that you can have. With that, we then have the flexibility to say, okay, instead of you know, eight four bedroom units, let's have 16 two bedroom units. Let's split them up and put two bedrooms based on what the market dictates. I think you saw down on, I think it's um, One East Pleasant, where they had an approval, came back, said the market doesn't like these number of units or bedrooms, we need to come back with something different. When we get, if we got this approved as an apartment, we're stuck at 24 units, so the numbers just don't work if you change those fours to only one two because you've already maxed out the 24 units. You can't from that four do two twos because then all of a sudden you're exceeding that uh, 24 unit limit. So at this point, that's why we're considering doing the mixed use. I've had the conversation with the building commissioner about his interpretation of the zoning bylaw and if that would fly and it seems like it would. Um, given what the zoning bylaw says in this limited business zoning district, which doesn't have those 40 per, the 40 percent requirement, I think that some of the other, or at least the general business zoning district, would have for mixed use. So that's the long and the short of it. That's why, but we're still working through it with conservation to make sure that they they agree. Chris, so I have a question for Mr. Reedy, which is that. Um, the mixed use building in our zoning bylaw is considered a residential use. So by what, um, cri what criteria do, does the Conservation Commission use to determine whether a building is um, residential or non-residential? That's exactly the question that we're looking to have answered. I think if, and you know, talking through it with uh, Beth Wilson, if it was the entire, if it's the entire first floor, is that 
commercial? If it's the majority of the building, is that commercial? So our position is that if we are able to have that office building without, you know, outside of the 75 foot setback, but within the building, and I mean, why I think it's okay to proceed this evening is you'll see from John's design, this design would be for totally residential or that mixed use because there's a little entry vestibule, you would be able to go up to where that commercial space was. So from the exterior, you're not gonna notice any difference. And so as a practical matter, our pitch to the CONCOM is, you wouldn't notice any difference on the resource areas. The, the effects on the resource areas wouldn't be any different because that commercial space is on the interior of the building. Um, if you want to put in a good word with uh, <laughs> Mr. Zomek or uh, Ms. Wilson, we'd appreciate that um, because we do think that is a good solution to what's happening here because of the constraints that we're dealing with. And it does give the flexibility to respond to the market to make sure that the housing product is actually one that's viable instead of saying, well, like I said, we'll have 10 four bedrooms here, which quite frankly, who knows in 10 or 15 years if the university gets more housing that, you know, there's four bedrooms on campus, people want to live there and these four bedrooms just aren't filled. Um, and I think having the flexibility of changing it to one and two bedrooms, which we do see a market demand for, and keeping the footprint the parking would be exactly the same, I think makes some sense. So long-winded, but that's the reason. Any other questions for Mr. Reedy before we move on to the next presenter? Okay. Can we take, leave that up just for a minute? Oh, sure. Even at a small <coughs> Good evening, John Kuhn, Kuhn Riddle Architects. Uh, as I had outlined when we were here back in October, uh, the challenge for this site was uh, one of mainly working around wetlands. And um, at that time, we also looked at a variety of ways to develop the site. We looked at one building with parking underneath. And, and the, the, uh, the project that we presented to you was three buildings, as, as Mr. Reedy mentioned, uh, sort of townhouse style buildings, three stories uh, that would not require any waiver in terms of height. Um, in looking to redesign this, we of course are still dealing with the wetlands. And as you can see, there is the, there he is. There's a 50-foot setback right there, that dash line. There's a 50-foot setback right there. That's the dash line. It, it explains a little bit why these buildings are, are angled the way they are. Um, the challenge in, in uh, looking to redesign this was trying to consolidate the number of units into two buildings instead of three. Um, we looked at leaving building one, which is the, the building towards the front, which is uh, six units, three stories. Uh, the owner and developer liked the, the overall design, so the challenge then became how do we uh, build a larger four-story building next to a three-story building and have them mesh architecturally. Uh, we looked at one point in trying to pull the parking underneath the building, but that didn't really make sense from an economical standpoint. So where we ended up was with a four-story building uh, with flats, essentially, with 24 units. Um, as Mr. Reedy was mentioning, in an ideal world, the 24 unit would not be a limitation. And I would, uh, on a side note, urge that the zoning subcommittee at some point look at that 24 unit limit because it's, people get around it by putting in a little bit of mixed use and, or a little bit of commercial and calling it mixed use. Um, that's certainly what Archipelago has done and I think the project down on, on uh, Route 9 that's going in is, was uh, non-conforming beforehand. So there are ways of getting around it, but if you take a strict interpretation of the zoning bylaw, the way it's written, 24 units is, is the limit. So that's the number of units in this building. Uh, there's 30 units total now. It would have been nice to put that into one building, but that was not really an option. So uh, that's the explanation for how we came to four stories 
It will require a waiver. We're able to go from 35 feet up to 45 feet uh, through a special permit process. Uh, I guess we want to go back to the. I think if you minimize it up here. All right, so. Um, I have four views of the buildings. You recall the one on the left is building one, so we're looking from sort of the south side of the site. Uh, the three buildings that we had previously all were variations on the building on the left. The building now on the right is four stories, and we tried to bring some of the elements of the three-story building into the four-story building. So we're using many of the same materials, uh, using a very similar roof line. Uh, the, as you'll see in some of the other uh, renderings, this is a, gable, a long gable shape that runs the entire length of the building. It's about 140 feet long. Uh, and then these gables are uh, sort of uh, projecting out, cantilevered out about two feet from the building uh, in a different color, sort of uh, reminiscent of the, the, the dormers that are on the, uh, the original building. This is looking more from the southeast corner, so you're able to see the, uh, the newer building, the four-story building. Uh, we'll be right at the 45 feet uh, uh, limitation. Uh, the site, as you recall, is sloping up from University Drive towards the rear. So uh, with a long building like this, the, the grade is, is uh, sloping up about four feet. I think you see it best in this, this uh, rendering from the sort of the southwest corner. You see building one on the left. Uh, so what we'll do is the, the uh, entrance to the building will, will be at the southwest corner of the four-story building. Uh, it'll be four stories down from the first floor slab. There'll be sort of a stone base that runs around, and then you can see the grade on the south side sloping up to uh, sort of the, the first floor slab level towards the east end. Um, that southwest corner will be an entrance, and it'll have an elevator that provides access to the first floor and to the other floors as well. Um, there are six units per floor, uh, so they're all stacked. There's one one, one two, two threes, and two fours. Uh, per floor at the present time. Whether that changes some, as Mr. Reedy was mentioning, we don't know yet, but that's, uh, that's where we stand at the moment. And then this, I think, gives the, the best view from University Drive coming in. So the, the uh, goal was to try to, to, to bring the two buildings together, build something that's four stories yet uh, is, is, uh, in, is compatible with the, the, the three-story building that we already had designed. So that is my presentation. Chris. Um, I had two comments. One is that um, putting the uh, units all together in a four-story building um, actually alleviates some of the concerns about drainage because there's less roof area for runoff. So that's a positive. Um, the, the other question I have is with regard to requesting a special permit for the height for four stories. Um, the special permit is under footnote A, and so um, footnote A asks the applicant to look at the surrounding area to find um, within the context of the building, uh, are there other buildings that are similar? And I'm wondering if the uh, applicant has, has thought about that. Are there buildings in the area that have a similar height? I don't know of any four-story buildings in the immediate area. There are some 20-story buildings further down University Drive, um, but there is nothing uh, of... Slobodies, yeah. Slobodies, Slobodies is, is that three or four? That might be four. It's tall. And I, I mean, I think to John's point, you know, if you're traveling northerly in University Drive, what you see in the distance are those taller university buildings. And I think that somewhat frames the backdrop. And, I guess that's how you define the neighborhood, but um, I think we would suggest that this fits in, especially given the surrounding topography, you know, to the east, you're only, you get to where we are now. Um, everything inclines till you get to the center of town, and so I think even from the west looking at it, I think it's gonna fit in because of the hilly backdrop, Blue Hills Road and so on, till you get to the center of town. So while there may not be one building we could point to to say, 
it looks like this or it is like this, I, I think it will fit into the context of the neighborhood given what that neighborhood is. Other questions or comments from the board? So at some point in the near future, the applicant will be making a determination about whether to be coming to the ZBA or the planning board with this. Is there a sense of the timeline on a CONCOM determination? Um, Beth Wilson and I went back and forth today a little bit. I would expect over the hopefully the next few days because um, we're having a stormwater design redone based on this plan, which is fine because either route that we take, the footprints are staying the same. So it really is just having conversations with um, the Director of uh, Conservation and Development, Dave Zomek, Beth Wilson, Ms. Brestrup, Mr. Moore, just to see what the, the sense is, and that will then determine what the floor plan is, which will determine who we come before. And so I guess this evening what I would request is if you would, should we decide to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for an apartment, make the recommendation to them, similar to as you did on uh, October 18th, that this is a project worthy of your support. Uh, if we come before you, obviously you'll have the merits to decide at that point. Um, essentially saving us a trip to come back once we do make that final decision. Chris? Um, I have another question, which is that um, I understand if the larger building becomes a mixed use building that that would come before the planning board. But um, with the smaller building, wouldn't that still remain an apartment building? And wouldn't that need to go to the ZBA? <coughs> so it would be kind of a mixed, mixed uh, yeah, board I, here? I think that's a great point. I think it, I, I think it would. Well, my general sense is that we may want to wait to see what direction that this goes. I feel it's a little early in the process for the board to make a recommendation. Um, my sense is that although the board did so back in October, uh, this project is of a somewhat different nature, and I think that the, um, the heights involved require some different levels of scrutiny. So um, I'd suggest that the applicant uh, return to us when a decision is made about which course uh, they're taking, although it sounds like it may actually be both in, in one scenario. Um, that's my sense. Do other board members? Mm -hmm. I, w I would agree with that. I think, I think talking about this is really premature was before we know what's going to be on that ground floor. Any comments about the architecture um, or the site layout as we're thinking about it? Were alternative color schemes considered? The yellow is jumping out at me a little bit. It does jump. Uh, we did look at a variety of color schemes. And, and I, I, I think last time I brought the color chips, which I think are better to look at than the renderings, but um, I don't have them with me tonight, so. All right, Rob? Um, I, I like the yellow, but um, I, so um, a mixed use building is a site plan review building, it's not, it's not a, a special permit building. Um, that'd be a shame to lose the to lose the affordable units. But I, I'll note that I believe under your zoning bylaw, if you have more than ten units above the first floor in the BL zoning district, oh, in the BL, I think okay. it is special permit. Which right. And then maybe if we're talking about, I mean. In one of the designs that we've thought of, there may be you know, 47 units if they're smaller bedrooms, which triggers five affordable units instead of the four affordable units that we would have otherwise provided under you know, 30 units or 37 units. So we still do have to provide the affordable units. Thank you, I forgot about that. Sure. Chris? I'm thinking that we should check that because it may just apply to commercial as instead of commercial NBL now that they're separated in the used in the dimensional chart. I see several of us looking through the bylaw. Does right. anyone have a, a reference? <laughs> so the conclusion is Mr. Crowner. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, yeah, in, in, 
in those limited business districts not abutting the BG district, a special permit um, is required when residential uses above the first floor exceed 10 units. Yeah. So he's right. All right. He's right. Okay. So it requires a special permit. I'll take it. So you didn't reference the affordable units in your presentation, but there's an assumption that they would be there? They would be there, yes. Okay. And whether it's in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals for apartments or in front of you for mixed use, special permit, they will be there. We've also already had discussions with the Amherst Housing Authority about their uh, desire and capacity to uh, monitor and um, manage essentially those units and they're on board. Um, this is probably an emergent issue based on, I think, how we just realized this could go two concurrent paths to the two boards, but does staff have an opinion or does the applicant have an opinion about an issue we could encounter where we have two different unit counts in terms of the affordable housing requirement? So we have one building that's six units and one that's 40. One that so would, ostensibly the six wouldn't trigger the nine plus that would otherwise be required under the affordable. But I mean, I, I think we're probably looking at the total number of units. I mean, I don't think we're, yeah. Okay. I don't think we're trying to pull a fast one. Christine. So maybe I missed this earlier, but did you look, cause it is a big difference in the sizes. And I understand you didn't maybe want to redesign the first building, but was there any thought to moving some of the units into the first? And, and if you did that on the first building, does some of it um, fit into the commercial 75 foot? I don't think so. And I think the need to provide an elevator if we went up a story for that first one, um, is that would be the issue if you went to a four went to a four story yeah and i don't so this right here what what um john has designed has an entry all entries are on that first level you've got a one and a three bedroom in that first vertical column a four in the second vertical column another four bedroom in the third vertical column and then another one in a three in that fourth vertical column so there's really not a lot of room um, to expand unless you add a story or you had each floor be a separate you know um, unit and the problem with that is you're having somebody schlep up three floors which is something we wanted to avoid so then if you go to the fourth story to get the density to justify it you're, you're talking about an elevator at hundred and fifty thousand dollars which starts to make the uh, economics not work so yeah I, we have tried to toss this around every which way to to get it to work and this is what we've come up with. Could then, um, could you just flip back to the map page of the wetlands just because we don't have a map here and I can't yeah. remember. Be down at the bottom, PDF, the orange one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, thank you. And could you just show where that, the 50 line is on the whole? Sure. Yeah. I remember on the first building it curves in. Yeah, let me um, see if I can. Right, right, yeah, I'm gonna zoom in just there. a little bit so you can. So if you follow where this little hand is, right there, right there, right here. Yeah, this is, that's why when I say, you know, this is the, this is the footprint. And so if it's mixed use and it turns out to, you know, the footprint isn't expanding. The number of floors from four wouldn't expand. The 45 feet is the max that we would go. So this, this seems like to have the maximum on the site that we could, you know, taking into consideration, not developing this back area for the hopes that we can actually get this approved, get some housing on this site within the foreseeable future instead of five years down the road. Um, so that's, that's why we've designed it the way we have. I think it's why the site is still undeveloped. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we think we have an approach of requesting the applicant come back when they've made a decision about their own approach. Are there any other final questions, comments from the board on this? Nope. Okay, well, okay. thanks for joining us. We look thanks forward to lot, seeing right. you again soon. Great, thank thanks. you very much. I'm with this next one. I'll talk to you after. <laughs> So we're gonna move on to the next item on our agenda, item 4B. This is South Point Apartments, East Hadley Road.
proposed new apartment building and site improvements, review and recommendations to Zoning Board of Appeals. I do have images of that on the computer. Yeah, I think you have them. This, the only difference is that this one has, uh, the one that we sent you has that built, this one doesn't have it, so they can oh, see. Oh, yeah, the, the existing. Okay. If you did want to use this. So I've got, um, yeah. you want to use this It's just the location. Yeah. corner I think right. and, and the, the thing that looks like four no oh. not that one let me drive, drive for a minute okay great uh, so good evening again for the record Tom Reedy attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of uh, Ronex Corp uh, the landowner of South Point um, here in Amherst with me this evening from Berkshire Design Carlos Nieto the landscape architect uh, our architect, David O'Sullivan, and the representative of the landowner, Byron Jeldon. Um, so what we are looking at here is some infill development. And when we talked about just previously for University Drive, 24 units being the max, this site actually has buildings with um, buildings that exceed 24 units. So it's pre-existing non-conforming because it's apartments in the RN zoning district, which apartments are not allowed in that zoning district. So the use is pre-existing non-conforming. The number of units in a building already exceeding 24 is pre-existing non-conforming. Um, we also have some other pre-existing non-conformities such as the um, unit breakdown your zoning bylaw requires that no more than 50% of any apartment be of one type of unit. The buildings existing on this site already have a majority of a certain bedroom unit in the buildings, uh, more than 50%. And so we would be looking for that same relief here. Um, we also already exceed lot coverage, um, and we're going to look to continue to exceed that. This is a Zoning Board of Appeals special permit um, to expend or enlarge a pre-existing non-conforming use and to modify previous special permits. So we will be in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for this one. Maybe, Carlos, if yeah. you want to take them through the for site sure. plan. Yeah. I wanted you to, in addition, yeah. My name is Carlos Nieto, I'm a virtual design group. Um, and I, you're seeing uh, what we are proposing. I just wanted to make sure that you understood what was there before. So what we're proposing is this 47 unit uh, building that you're seeing, which is in this area right now, which is right now open space, so open area in the site. Uh, the second um, uh, item that we're proposing on the site is an uh, expanded parking lot, which is what you're seeing on the top there uh, with a play area uh, next to it in, in an open uh, patio or a big uh, kind of patio area, uh, which is 30 extra parking space. Um, and so in that area or that I'm talking about is this area, so right now there is no, no building or anything built right now in that area. I just want to, so that you understand um, what was there before and what we're proposing right now. Uh, as Tom re, uh, mentioned, we are in the South Point uh, apartment complex, which there's a property line that goes basically right in, right in this area, and this side is what's called the Boulders, Boulder Apartments. So those are the two apartment complexes, one next to each other. Um, what the client is proposing is a new 47 uh, unit building, which will include uh, 43 uh, parking spaces uh, off of it. 
um, sidewalks, uh, everything's going to be ADA accessible. Um, we will have the trash receptacles that are going to be attached to that building. As part of the project for uh, the designing and, and building this building, will be to expand or to take away some of the parking spaces, the existing parking spaces that are right now there. Uh, and that's why we're proposing this new parking area, also the 30 spaces, so that we can um, accommodate all the, all the <coughs> cars that are going to be here. Um, the, uh, we'll, we're proposing three uh, ADA parking spaces, and you can't really see here, but um, we'll have uh, bike racks right in the entrance so that, that there's also bike racks available. The second part, um, well, there will be back access to um, the um, uh, trash receptacle area, and, uh, and then the main, three main entrances, one main entrance and two uh, other entrances on the side. To the north of our site, as you Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Could you use the microphone when you're yes. walking around? I'm with you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to the north of the site, um, which is what you're seeing on, on, on the screen right now, is the, this proposed parking, extra parking area, uh, 30 uh, parking area. And then we will... We're also proposing a, an area for a picnic uh, barbecue area, kind of a bigger uh, paved area plaza with, also that will be the area where the uh, mailboxes are. Just a reminder to hold the mic oh, up. If you just and then a proposed playground off of that uh, in that area just to balance out the fact that we've taken out uh, a, some of the recreation that existed in the site, which was in this area originally. And that's uh, the majority of the site plan. In addition to what you're seeing as for hardscape, uh, we're proposing uh, plantings to soften off and to bring some green into the area surrounding the parking. And there are existing uh, mature trees that we're going to be keeping on this area and also on, on this area as much as possible. Um, I believe that's, that's uh, the details on the site plan. Um, I'm going to leave it to David Sullivan to explain the architecture. And I'll, I'll put <laughs> All right, David O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan Architects. Um, one of the things we, um, before the board, the existing South Point has the massive mansard roofs, and part of the thing that was approved before was to take those off through your board before and create it. So um, there was a fire in one of the buildings, and we kind of basically have taken that same scheme for the exterior that matches what we're kind of phasing in on the rest of the project. So. The new building, as far as colors, materials, style, will match eventually what everything in South Point will look like for the exterior. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did do is we were developing this, um, and we're trying to propose pretty much everything over there has the same unit type. So one of the things with doing a building of this shape and this size was to offer basically the entire building is ADA accessible. So all 47 units will be handicapped adaptable and we'll do the 5% of the full handicapped accessible as per the building code. But by doing, concentrating everything in here, we could do an elevator. Um, do the first floor first. have main building entry right in the knuckle with um, common spaces and an elevator. So we could basically have, and we have secondary entrances here and here off of the main parking area. So that basically all the first floor units are accessible, every, every, even the exit up back is accessible. And then by putting in the elevator, all 47 units become something that's not offered basically in the other buildings, because the other buildings have limited accessibility. So by concentrating them into one big building versus trying to do, say, two smaller 24-unit buildings at this location, um, we're able to get the economics of making an elevator and creating kind of a different unit type and a different option 
for people renting on the site. Um, these are pretty much all two bedrooms with a couple threes. <coughs> but um, they're all um, set up and give kind of an option that is not available to people at South Point now. So, any, any other questions, let me know. Chris. I wonder if the architect would describe the materials that are um, going to be used on the building? So as per the other South Point, um, the base is a brick um, masonry, and the upper would be composite uh, clapboards, um, double hung windows, um, French balconies, um, and just composite trim. So basically trying to mimic what we're doing on the other building. Uh, to revisit a point I made during the last application, this is requiring a special permits, so there will be affordable units provided. Correct, there will be six affordable units provided as part of this process, special permit. Are there existing project-based um, affordable units in the current development? Yes. Um, and I don't know if it's under a special permit, but there are uh, 21 units occupied by those who hold Section 8 vouchers. I haven't done the math to figure out or taken a look to see if it's a regulatory agreement or otherwise, but yes, there are affordable units there. Great. Jack? Uh, I was curious about the parking and how the northern parking lot will be utilized, uh, by whom, and... You know how how that is a a function of the of the new building, or is it a fact a, a factor of displacing existing parking? So the way that we're we're doing the parking actually. Can't, can't Sorry, could you just grab the microphone again? Sorry, could you grab the microphone? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the next parking over. We are proposing a sidewalk that will connect these two buildings that we also connect to that area where the parking lot is right now. Uh, we are displacing some parking spaces on this area, but what we found out is that the parking spaces are, are, are adequate right now for the people who live there, and the ratio right now we have of parking is about one in seven total for the whole project. Um, by uh, this proposal and having to have uh, taken out some of that parking spaces, uh, and providing uh, these 30 parking spaces. We stay in a very similar ratio of 1.61, 1.62. So we're still in the same ratio as what it is or very similar to the ratio that we had uh, before. Um, it is one of the only places also to uh, foot feasibly putting parking in here um, at this moment. Uh, uh, one other point, uh, we had looked at this area for more apartments. Um, and if that's an ideal area for more apartments, and it would be really far, you know, much farther away from where we were taking some of that parking spaces. So that was one of the, the uh, uh, reasons why we cited those 30 parking spaces there. Um, and then we we're providing 43 parking spaces in, in the area next to the, to the actual building. So the building just to the north of the proposed building, that one, the, they will be gravitating to the northern parking lots yes, over time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Michael? Um, I, I have a question about the, the gray areas just north of the proposed new building. Uh, the two other buildings. Are there two, there are two buildings? Yeah, there's a building right here. Okay. And another building right here. And those are apartment buildings as well. They're, those are apartment buildings. Um, apartment I th buildings. I'm sorry. I, I read the, the white um, erratically shaped buildings as the apartments. Oh, no. So uh, in total, there are 10 buildings right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, which is kind of outside of the, of the view. And this will be our, our 11th building. Got it. Where does the project stand now with building and lot coverages, and where will it after? So right now, in lot coverage, we are at existing at 31% and proposed at 35%. Uh, for building coverage, we are under the 20% maximum. We are at 10.4% existing and 12.5% proposed. Um, of course, the increase uh, on the lot coverage comes from the, par the parking areas and providing um, some of that uh, 
uh, uh, yeah, recreational facility. So. Well, one of my initial reactions is that the planning board over the last few years has looked at ways to increase density in an appropriate, appropriate manners at apartment complexes like this, and I think that the project uh, achieves that. And the apartments are already located near transportation. Uh, I wish they were nearer to services. I think that that's something that residents there cite often, but the tra public transportation there is very strong. Um, so to me, it seems like an uh, appropriate <coughs> infill at this, at this complex. It's a great point about the public transportation. One of the other... Um, the area where we're putting that 30 uh, parking spaces is right in front of where the also the uh, bus bus stop is and we'll have that recreational uh, element right across from there so if you're waiting for the bus you can be and your child could be in the playground or you could be uh, there so yeah we were taking into consideration that public transportation and is this application already submitted to the zba no we'll sub um We'll submit it next week for the February 22nd Zoning Board of Appeals hearing. So I take it you're looking to us for the same thing you did with the prior project? Read my mind. Okay. Um, well, I think in the case of this one, I'd be happy to recommend this to the ZBA unless there's any board member objections. No, I think it's a good project. I think we should recommend it. Uh, is there a motion on that? I move to recommend uh, that we to the ZBA that we approve the project. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further discussion, Rob? Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with just saying to approve the project. Right. I think we should move that it's that it's in keeping with with the master plan or, or you know whatever, the, that it, whatever that the appropriate language is that it, it satisfies the infill um, goals of, of the planning board and. and and it seems appropriate for the site, and 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 it should um, be looked on uh, favorably by the ZBA, something like that. Chris, did you catch that? <laughs> 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 Is that an approved amendment to your motion, Michael? Sure. Okay, great. All right, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thanks, Thanks for so joining much. us. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. All right, we'll move on then to the next item on our agenda. It's new business topics not reasonably anticipated none okay we'll move on to form a a and r subdivision applications chris we did have an a and r sub uh, a and r application but we didn't hear back from the town engineer in time to present it to you but let me explain it to you um actually i could run into my office and show it to you and then perhaps ask mr schreiber to come in uh at a later date to sign it because i don't think um I think the 21 days is going to run out by the time you meet next time. So let me just run into the office and grab it. So the property is on Shootsbury Road, and it turns out that um, the person who owns this property actually has a well that is on an adjacent property. Um, we're not sure how that happened, but um, I can show you a plan of the, of the site, and you'll see where the well is located. And this person is acquiring a strip of land at the back of the property um, for the purposes of having the well on her property. Um, the parcel on which the well is located is in Chapter 61, Chapter 61, I think, forestry. So that will have to be taken out of Chapter 61 in order to complete this transaction. Um, but in any event, this is the first step along the way. So let me show you the property. They're just adding this part here. Okay. Yeah. Needed a survey. Oh man. Okay. Would you authorize Mr. Schreiber to sign this when he's available? 
Yes. Yes. Is that the only A and R? Okay. Upcoming ZBA applications. We heard about two possible ones. I um, I'm not aware of any other new ones. Okay. Any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Nope. All right, move then on to item eight, planning board committee and liaison reports, PVPC. Uh, no, nothing has happened since the last meeting. Okay, CPA. Yeah, so we met last week and we're currently going through the questions and answers for the projects and things are moving along and we have another meeting next week, so. Great, thanks. Uh, design review board. Um, Mr. McCarthy drew up a detailed memorandum of our meeting yesterday, which you have in front of you, uh, and it clearly summarizes what we did, which was basically discuss the, uh, our, our public art proposal that we heard about a few minutes ago. Great. The Housing Trust met last week. We talked more about uh, developing a policy proposal for other boards in towns that would lay out housing targets for production of affordable housing over the next five years. And the group will still be working on that. It's coming meetings, and we also looked at prioritizing CPA proposals related to affordable housing. We already heard from the zoning subcommittee. Uh, UTAC, housing hasn't met, has economic, nope, okay. Downtown parking working group. Um, met yesterday, working on an employer, employee parking survey for downtown Amherst that will come out soon and working on revising commercial parking downtown. Next meeting is February 7th at 10.30. Great, thank you. Chris? May I make an addition to that? Um, two illustrious members, or at least one member and one um, staff member of the D Downtown Parking Working Group are presenting to the Massachusetts Municipal Association this weekend about all the good work that has been done by the group over the last year and um, talking about how it's turned out. There are two other towns that are um, also presenting, but it seems that they have a very different approach. So it'll be really good for the people who are there to hear about Amherst's approach. Great, thank you. Um, report of the chair, I have no report. Report of staff. I just want to reiterate how thrilled I am to have Maureen Pollock working on our staff. <laughs> <laughs> we already gave her an assignment at the zoning subcommittee meeting. <laughs> Great, that's good to hear. Okay, then we're adjourned. Thanks, everyone.